we're continuing our uh, afternoon session and our lecturer is Dr. Tom Matthews from Lapter University. He will show, show us some programmatic downloading of weather station data and manipulation of the, of the data. So please, uh, Tom, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Biliana, and hello to everyone. Um, very nice to get the chance to meet you virtually. It's a lovely, it's a lovely spring afternoon here in the UK and I hope you're also basking in sunlight. Okay. Mm. No, not so much. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's coming. The, the turn of the seasons is, is moving in our favour and warmer weather's coming. And warmer weather is a great segue to, um, to kick off. So let me just uh, share my screen and hopefully mm, I'll put it in presentation mode. You can now, you know, seeing a nice, uh, oh, now you're seeing a nice uh, presentation. So um, please feel free to interrupt me as we go, um, but I'll otherwise begin, begin now. So I'm going to talk to you about, yeah, pro, as it says on the tin, programmatic downloading and manipulation of weather station data and a particular uh, archive of weather station data that's incredibly useful if you're interested in extreme events, uh, extreme heat and actually precipitation. I'll say a few more words about the data set that we'll be looking at and working with in a few moments. Um, just a, a, a request, the slides don't seem to be updating, let me know, I know that's one thing that I've done before in doing these remote presentations is talking the slides aren't updated, so please um, let me know if, if it's not changing. You should now see the aims and outline of the session. So what we're going to do, what I'm going to do this afternoon then, is just spend not very long um, talking, giving some context to the, the material that we'll cover, so a few opening slides to highlight the importance of observations from weather stations. I know this morning you had a talk from Carly uh, talking about climate models as uh, predictive tools looking forward into the future, um, but also reanalyses products, ERA 5, etc. cetera, um, that can be used to look at what's happened so far. And it's tempting to substitute direct observations or rather substitute reanalyses for direct observations. But I'll make the case that the direct observations coming from weather stations are absolutely critical if you are interested in studying extreme events in the context of climate change too. And then having made that case, it's only fair that I um, provide you with the tools to make such access as easy and convenient as it is to get a hold of reanalyses data sets. Um, so I'll introduce though the archive that we'll be working with in these opening slides, and also say a few words of context for the programmatic tools that we're gonna be using to access um, that, that, that archive. And then the majority of the session will be a guided programming workshop um, where I prepared some somewhat um, independent, independent is the wrong word, but some, some notebooks and tools that you can work through with me here to provide some commentary, some introduction and to troubleshoot, but otherwise you need to work with on your own machines, running through to, to follow a story really that introduce you to programming if you haven't done it before. If you have to highlight how these programming tools can be used to do or fulfill a particular task, complete the particular task that we're asking you to do. Um, so you get some hands-on uh, experience using Python to access and manipulate local weather station data. And actually you'll see that you can pull out any weather station or data from any weather station um, that's in the archive. So anywhere on earth, but we'll practice using data from somewhere very close to where you're probably sitting right now. Um, okay, so let's, let's carry on. So first, some, some context, and this is context for observations to the climate system and in particular of temperature we'll see shortly the big climate change picture the reason why we're well, i'm doing this job and why many of you i imagine are interested in climate change climate extremes is that there is a radiative imbalance in the earth's climate system the earth is accumulating energy accumulating energy because we are making it harder for long wave radiation to escape from the uh, from the Earth system. And that escape of long wave radiation um, is, is required, or a certain amount is required, to, to equilibrate or dissipate the short wave radiation coming in. So, as we're retarding the emission of long wave radiation, energy is building up in the Earth system. And that, that, um, that drop in the emission of long wave radiation is due to the emissions of greenhouse gases. That's why we're 
That's why we're uh, concerned. That's why we're sitting here talking about, about climate change. So relative imbalance is fundamentally what's driving climate change. Um, but we often, the very fact I've started with this may seem a bit odd to some of you because we're so used to not talking about the relative imbalance, but talking about the symptoms of that relative imbalance. The symptoms of the relative imbalance well, the symptom is climate change we can break down into many small components for example increasing sea levels decline in the extent of land and sea ice um, changes to the hydrological cycle retreating glaciers etc um, but almost universally we talk in terms of increasing air temperatures that is a symptom of the rates of imbalance the increasing air temperature directly tracks the sensible heat content, the energy content of the atmosphere. So that's a key symptom. Changing air temperatures are a key symptom of the rate of imbalance. That energy accumulation pushes the temperature up. So that's why air temperatures are a key indicator of climate change. That's why we use air temperature to track climate change. Not direct, um, a direct measure of the rate of imbalance, but it is almost the universally accepted, or is the universally accepted measure of tracking air temperature. So when we see plots like this, or we're very used to seeing plots like this on the left, this is from NASA GISTEM, um, looking at the annual temperature anomaly 2019 to 2020 relative to that baseline period we're now one degree above average so this is the metric this is the language that we're used to to uh, talking about climate change used to using to talk about climate change the change in air temperature and this these uh, the data that form this gridded or this map that you see on the left they're coming from weather stations so air temperature measurements from weather stations interpolated to produce a continuous continuous record with also observations over the oceans coming from ships and more recently buoys as well but fundamentally over the land surface the air temperature measurements coming from weather stations this is the currency that we use to talk about climate change we also use weather station or measurements of air temperature from weather stations to track changes to metrics that are directly relevant to human health and well-being for example the frequency of warm days and warm nights so not only is air temperature a really useful measure for tracking the big story of climate change the energy accumulation from rate of imbalance tra tracking air temperature change is also acutely important for inferring keeping track of impacts on people in the context of air temperature we're often concerned about the fre changing frequency of very hot weather, be it at night or being during the day. And we'll talk about, um, in this context, we'll talk about hot weather in a relatively confined sense, just talking about air temperature. In the senior researchers session later, we'll go into a bit more detail about, we'll go into a bit more detail about what heat really, really is. But for now, I just appreciate that air temperature measurements from weather stations are critical for two things. One, the overall climate change story, to for anything, anything that relates to society that is temperature sensitive, we need to track temperatures and weather stations are making the case, uh, track temperatures to infer the, the impacts on those temperature sensitive systems. And how do we, oh, there's a, a picture that's, that's going to appear as part of an animation, there it is. Um, how do we measure air temperature? What, what do these air temperature records look like? How far back do they go? Well, they go back a very long time. One of the, I think the longest, um, observed meteorological quantity is air temperature. The longest record in the world is from pretty much right where I'm sitting. So I'm in Loughborough in the East Midlands of England, that's central England, and it's home to, not Loughborough, but the region, is home to the longest temperature series on Earth. It goes back to 1667, the central England uh, temperature series, shown in this plot on the right here. And it's been observed for such a long time, from Dose of Noise Mark, Outside there. It's been observed for such a long time, it's been able to be observed for such a long time because it's quite simple to observe or to monitor change in air temperature. Historically, using mercury thermometers, the mercury expands, it's heated, the density decreases, so it takes up more space in the thermometer. We, we register that, uh, we track that, or we can use that to track changes in air temperature. And you see the scientist here, it won't be a mercury thermometer, it would be a thermometer using the same principles, um, measuring air temperature at Furnace Creek. Death Valley, a holder of the, of the highest air temperature recorded on Earth. We had the second highest air temperature recorded on Earth at this weather station um, in July, I think it was, or August of 20, 
it was 2020. Yes, it was 2020. Um, and about 54 and a bit degrees Celsius. That's how hot it can get on Earth. Um, so measured with historically with mercury or, or now some other similar uh, liquid based thermometer. More recently, um, and in remote deployments where people aren't going to access uh, or can't get access to the, the stations to actually read off a value, we use automatic weather stations, we use platinum thermistor sensors uh, where current is passed through a piece of platinum and the resistance is proportional to the temperature. Um, so we can infer temperature using or passing electronic currents through and that's suitable for remote operation. So these weather stations you're looking at here on the left, the highest operating weather station in the world, South Coal, Mount Everest, and that's recording as we speak, beaming weather stations, well, beaming hourly air temperatures uh, back and broadcast on the internet live. So we span a full sort of spectrum of complexity with our air temperature measurements. Manual measurements of some stations, automatic uh, measurements of other weather stations, both very accurate, and that's why we have this really good long-term record of, of air temperature made at weather stations around the world. And these observations are critical. You, this morning, I know you, there's a lot to take in with the climate models the, or the modeling bit, but a key bit for this morning's um, session would have been the revelation that there, if you haven't heard of them before, there are these things called reanalysis data sets that provide globally complete high resolution records of the recently observed or the recently, occur, recently occurred weather. And that can be fantastically powerful to infer um, what may have gone on in different parts of the world through time to deduce rates of energy accumulation, for example, by looking at air temperature change or the changing frequency of extremely hot weather in different parts of the world um, or extreme rainfall events, etc. Depending on what the, the, whatever metric you're interested in, you can use reanalysis data because they're globally available at hourly resolution, 25 kilometer uh, spatial resolution in terms of error five. So really convenient. But they're not observations. They include observations, but they're ultimately um, partly modelled. And if you if you use those, as shown in this plot, we'll actually end up underestimating extremes. And we're obviously interested really in extremes at the heart of this of this workshop. This is from a piece of work uh, conducted last year, lead authors Colin Raymond, um, showing you the offset between extreme wet bulb temperatures, which is a measure that just includes hu uh, humidity in the uh, in how hot it feels, really. Um, that's in orange. Histogram is in orange. The values are on the x-axis, frequency of observation, of course, on the y-axis. Uh, so we're looking at the, the, hot, the hottest grid cells in particular regions in orange and the hottest observations in those regions in green. The observations are always hotter. The reanalyses smooth out any, uh, any extremes, really. Uh, because the, the values you get from reanalysis products represent a spatial average. And the, if you think very crudely, we know temperature increases generally the lower you go in the atmosphere. So in a given grid cell that's 25 by 25 kilometers wide, everything else equal, the lowest point in that grid cell will be lower than the average point in the grid cell and it will be hotter. And with some measures, we are interested in absolute values. So when we're interested in extreme heat, there, there can be more so in the context we add humidity in, but there can be absolute thresholds independent of your physiology that start to affect you. So it's no good just tracking variability of reanalysis data. The trends may be the same. You want to know the frequency which dangerous observations or dangerous conditions are encountered in particular locations. We need um, we need observations from weather stations, okay? Because the absolute value matters. So that offset. If it's a continuous offset of maybe one or two degrees, that can really matter in terms of the frequency of, of dangerously hot weather. Reanalysis will track the pattern, but it won't get the frequency of those, those dangerously hot conditions. So reanalysis re are useful, observations are critical. So where can we get observations from? How do we access these, um, get access to, to these measurements of, of air temperature in particular, which is the focus of what we're talking about today, but more generally, where do, for interest in extreme heat in particular, where can we, where can we get hold of the relevant, um, the relevant quantities? So on this slide, there's some key, some key archives and the blue text shows us a hyperlink. These slides are on the, the shared folder. You click on them, I'll take you through to the, to the website. The Global Historic Climate Network, fantastic resource, tens of thousands of stations ultimately, and then majority, I think, precipitation only, but there are many in there, thousands that will also record uh, temperature. I think daily resolution is the 
is the default there. So uh, daily max mean temperature and precipitation totals. There's also the European Climate Assessment and Data Set Record link there. Global summary of the day. This is a very nice data set to access. Um, one, it's uh, daily resolution. So that's it's very useful for, for most uh, sorts of analyses you'll be interested in. Um, includes a large number of meteorological parameters, so not just uh, temperature or humidity, but just like sea level pressure, precipitation amount, cloud cover. Um, and in terms of just a nice practical uh, issue here, highly, highly easy to access on a station by station basis if you're only interested in one or two stations using this map server that's linked here. So you go through to an ArcGIS server and you can view where the stations are and turn on different layers, move around the map, just like um, you used to do on Google Earth or something, seeing where, the, seeing where the stations are, clicking on them, seeing what's available, the length of record, requesting uh, that data set by just clicking on the form and then downloading. So that's really nice, easy to access, um, but, but really good for one or two stations. There's, what we'll focus on later in the workshop is a scalable method that can allow us to download um, data from every other station on Earth and apply the same, the same analysis. And we'll be doing that with this last data set, data sets that are, are listed on this page. So the most comprehensive worldwide for access is the integrated, or arguably the most comprehensive, is the integrated surface data set, which is an hourly data product from tens of thousands of weather, or over 10,000 weather stations worldwide. Not quite sure the final number, but we're talking about a lot of weather stations. And hourly data, that's a lot. Had ISD is a processed version, processed subset of the integrated surface data set. So it's a, it's a subset, it's been quality controlled. So one, I, I can't quite remember this stage, but I think only the subset is chosen uh, in a way that maximizes the availability of many, many parameters. So there's an initial subsetting based on availability of data, and then the, the stations that are ultimately make it into that subset uh, go through a rigorous quality control procedure. Um, and you can read about that on the, the linked page there, so the quality control procedures applied. I've worked with this data set quite a lot in the context of extreme humid heat, and there are still some issues in there. It's gone through this great quality control procedure, but the authors are very transparent, so some issues may remain. So if you use this for research purposes, uh, which you may go on to do, just be aware that um, it's still not perfect, and the sorts of issues that maybe Rob will be spoke about on the first day regarding quality control, they still apply here, even though it's gone through some quality control procedures. Um, bear that in mind. OK, so there's some commonly used archives that are holding raw or quality controlled weather station observations. And we're going to be working with HAD ISD, high quality subset of the ISD. It's hourly resolution or up to hourly. Some, some stations reporting six hourly, some three hourly, some, some hourly, but it's ideally or generally sub daily resolution. OK, so how are we going to get access to these, to these weather stations? I said the likes of global some of the day, we just click on a map server, download one station at a time. Um, but if we're interested in big data analysis, we're interested in tracking what's going on all over the surface of the planet, wherever these weather stations exist, um, which ultimately is important if we want to do things like track uh, accumulating energy, track where the most severe humid heat has been experienced in recent decades and therefore where, where we may expect to be most stressed as the climate continues to warm. We need a method to be more, or we need a be really useful to have tools that can allow us to systematically and reproducibly analyze many, many weather stations. Uh, and then we could actually all the convenience and, and all the benefits to convenience to reanalysis data too, because we can programmatically pull in lots of data and analyze stuff. So we, we can use programming tools, languages, to help us with, with this. And I know Manfred on the first day, I think, had you uh, look at some Fortran programming, so a low-level language. Interpreted high-level languages like Python and R make our life, can make our life very easy for doing this sort of work because there are lots of very um, kind-hearted or community-minded programmers out there that are working on similar generic problems and writing code, packaging that code up into, into modules that can be used by other researchers to do some of the the, the complex intermediate bit that comes from well, when you want to do something like download a file automatically from the internet using computer code rather than clicking on something. So there are, there are, there are packages in four languages like Python and R 
that, it, that exist to, to do this sort of work. When I say this sort of work, I mean generally pulling down data sets from websites um, and then other packages that are well suited to things like time series analysis, uh, plotting, et cetera, to then help us actually analyze those meteorological data that, that come down. So we'll be working with Python. Um, there's a nice comparison here. R is again, very commonly used as type of analysis. MATLAB to a lesser extent in terms of uh, sort of data access and manipulation, but it's still used uh, somewhat in the, the earth sciences as type of work. R and Python have different strengths. They're both pretty pretty good and um, pretty good for this type of work in general. And I, I'd say if you know one, you can easily dip into the other and vice versa. I know some people I think that here may have experience in Java or JavaScript, C, C++, those types of languages. I'm sure you could do all of this in those languages too. Um, but a lot of the, um, the, the complex stuff is abstract, is removed in, when you use Python and R because um, there's a very big community in the earth sciences working in these languages and providing packages to remove some of the, the general complexities involved in this type of work. So we're going to use uh, Python to access the HAD ISD database. And we're gonna do that using Jupyter Notebooks. Don't know if any of you have used those before, but if you haven't, they're a really user-friendly uh, tool to help teach and learn programming uh, concepts. As you'll see when, we, when I share my screen in a minute, you essentially will be working with an interactive uh, PDF that has some instructions, a story, if you like, to follow with code embedded that you can run as you go through and it will do things. You can see what it's doing. And then at the end, some uh, some tasks, some challenges for you or some suggestions for you to change things and, and see what happens. At the minimum, what you get here is if you're interested in this type of analysis, and I imagine you all are to some extent uh, because you're at the workshop, but you have template code too to pull data from any weather station in the world from this had ISD archive and do something with it. So hopefully that is the minimum is will be useful in the in the workshop. Now there's two more things I wanted to mention. Yeah, one is with this power, the power here that we'll, we'll explore in the notebook, the power is to, with a few lines of code, to draw weather station data down from any station in the archive and analyze it pretty quickly uh, to do things like count the exceedances and temperatures above a threshold, um, aggregate that by year and then very tempting to try and put a trend line through it and work out whether the data is non-stationary etc that is practically very easy but remember the um that the, the everything we do that summarizes data very quickly and succinctly hides a lot of detail from us as well so as i'll show you in the in the notebook you, you very quickly produce annual exceedances and temperatures above a threshold um, but you don't know, for example, there's any missing data in that in that record. We, we haven't gone through the, the process of quality. We don't go through the process of manually quality controlling when we, when we use a method like this. It quickly takes down a data set and then throws it into a black box of analysis, essentially, and spits out a result. We can very quickly process all 10,000 odd stations in this archive. But just remember that in, in doing that, we have high potential to, to miss things. OK, so we have to be very diligent when we actually employ these, these methods to make sure that we, we're doing it all with coding, that we write code to try and catch errors that could creep in. Errors, for example, five years worth of missing data um, that we, we otherwise might not spot. Okay, so the last thing I want to say is that this method that I'll, I'll talk to you about, or that we'll use, and that is using a particular module in Python called the requests module, is incredibly flexible and it's almost hacker-esque in that what we're doing is we're, we're using this module to programmatically access data that hasn't really necessarily been set up for programmatic access. There are other huge range of other uh, data sets out there in the earth sciences um, that have been set up for programmatic access. So that I have an API that's designed for you to systematically call and pull down um, data sets. And there'll be guidance on the websites for those specific repositories, for example, free analyses data, for some other weather station archives, for how to programmatically access and pull down those data sets. The method I'm showing you here is if none of that exists, the data aren't uh, behind uh, some sort of security wall, this method can be used to pull down anything programmatically. It can be used down to, it can be used to pull files of any website. Um, as long as you know the URL of that of that file. 
and you can get the URL of that file from, see this is on the, I'm pointing this so you can see my hand, of course you can't, but on the screen, we have the had ISD homepage. You can get the URL of a particular, any of the files listed there by just right clicking and copying the, the link address. That gives you the URL. And then if you see there's a structure in the URLs, great thing with programming is if you spot a structure, you can change that structure programmatically. So this tool is this general tool, the, the request module is the this the kind of the last resort, the incredibly flexible last resort to systematically pull down data from anywhere really. Um, you'll find specific tools for specific data sets on the relevant websites for those products, for example, reanalysis. Okay, so now I'll show you uh, what the notebook looks like. So I just got to stop sharing this one and then um, just set it up on the other screen. So just bear with me while I finish messing around. Log into that computer. Okay, I can share again. Excuse me, I'm talking to myself. Um, so now you can see, um, oops, hopefully another screen. Um, this is my Linux computer that I'm remote desktop to. And what, I, what I've done to get to this stage um, is follow the instructions that I think you, that you've, had, you've had access to in the, uh, in the shared folder. It tells you how to launch Jupyter Notebook through either the start menu if you're working with Windows or to launch it through the terminal if working on Mac or Linux. And if you're Mac or Linux, you're just typing in Jupyter Notebook. Um, and actually you can also launch the same way if you're on Windows, you launch the Anaconda prompt, then you uh, have to change directory to the directory that your notebook is in with CD, type and then type the name of the directory, and then Jupyter Notebook, enter, and it will launch a browser in, in your uh, browser window in your browser. And you'll be able to see the, the contents of the directory that you're in. You can navigate down the tree, you can't go back up though. And if you've already CD'd into the, into the directory with your notebook, then you can just click on it, and it will, I've actually got two of these, two of these open now, and it will, launch that in another new uh, window and you can see the really nice thing with these notebooks is we have text description this is markdown text um, and then we have code too and this is this is python code and we can run this code just like you know, if you're used to programming python or, R or anything else um, this runs just like it would in a, in a your favorite ide uh, or anything else this is fully fledged functioning Python code, just as embedded in your, your browser window. This is a, an IPython notebook that's actually termed a Jupyter notebook. So for the, for the contents of complex language aside, it's a really simple tool at the end. It's a story, so you're reading the text, and the way to follow this is to read all the text. Then when you get to the code, you can run it by either clicking run up here, or as I say in the in the instructions, my favorite method is the control and enter um, method. So when you're in the in the cell, just click in there, control enter, it will run. And you'll see, I'll run this here, you'll see that we had number 204 pop up. That means it's the 204th command that I've issued in this particular, on this particular notebook. Um, when you run lots of them, you see a little star up there, the asterisk sign telling you that the, the notebook is, is working. Um, and then some, some code cells, don't seem to do anything. This one, for example, the first one that you run, um, I should, yeah, I'll talk you through this actually, because if you haven't, and I apologize if you know Python, this is this is not new to you, but if if it is new to you, then all of this will be incredibly cryptic, so it will benefit from a bit of a, a bit of a, a description. If you know Python, you, you don't want to listen to this, or rather you want to get on with it than do, just start running through the through the notebook, um, and you'll see that there are some challenges towards the end for you to, for you to try things. But if you're new to this, then I'll just explain the first uh, the first sound and it might be useful you can see what so you can see what's going on and some of this is already explained by the way in the in the description up there but this first uh, cell has you notice it starts with the hash key and then uh, some text hash python is and in, in many other languages actually is a comment so it means it means to the interpreter to the python interpreter don't interpret this as code this isn't stuff that i'm trying to run these are, are comments for a human to read so to begin with we're starting with some some comments so i'm explaining what this is it's a code cell everything you see does not follow the 
hash character in Python computer code. Um, I'm not quite what I'm trying to say there actually, <laughs> but the uh, the hash hash key is a character code, so uh, character sorry comic character, so it's not going to be interpreted as code. Then we have a range of statements here, saying import um, and then some words after them, and they are then Python modules that allow us to um, to do certain bits of analysis or certain tasks in a, with, in a really straightforward way. The NumPy module is Python code written by developers to allow us to do numerical analysis of a data set. So things like the mean, the median, um, those kinds of basic statistical operations, they are defined in the NumPy module. So we can just type uh, equals mp.mean then give it some data and it will compute the mean. It knows what it knows what that term uh, refers to. Uh, the Carter Pi modules allows us to make plots, um, date time to deal with to deal with dates, gzip to, to unzip and zip files, netcdf4 to do a netcdf data. This is uh, for file management. This is the powerful request module to allow us to pull down data from, from websites. And this is one that allows us to suppress warnings that you would otherwise have. Um, so these all, to summarize, they're all pre-compiled Python tools, essentially, that allow us to really easily perform um, for relatively complex operations without having to tell Python how to do every bit. They're, they're pre-built uh, packages for us that, that make our life easy. And then the next thing you see in here, is a function definition that I've, I've given you, well, I've given us, I've written for us. And it, it simply is a way, it gives us a way of calculating the distance uh, between pairs of latitude, longitude points. We end up using that later on to calculate the nearest point to a, a nearest weather station to a particular point. And the, the, that's the specifics. The general point here is you can define functions in Python. There are functions sitting in all of these modules we've imported. I don't know of a, a Python module that has uh, distance, distances over, uh, that easily computes distances over uh, a curved surface, over the surface of the earth. So there's one written here that uses the have a sign formula. So I'm writing, I'm defining a new, a new function. That we can then call later. Calling in this case means that um, I can type in later on the word um, distance, put in a latitude, a longitude, so just one number representing, or two numbers representing the coordinates of one point, and then a range of candidate latitude, longitude, so columns of latitude, longitudes, and the function will return the distance from every point, every pair of coordinates to the reference point. So that's a really key idea of programming. We write functions and we call them later to, to do stuff for us. Um, and then just continuing my description for you, once you've run that, you then will get some more commentary here that tells us we're now set up to do some analysis. You will have the only bit you'll have to change when you first run through this um, through this notebook is uh, this the, the di bit. The di here is a variable that's defining the the folder that we're working in, and obviously this is the way it's set up at the moment. The di the directory is referenced to my computer. It's, to, it's saying where the that had isd.csv file that you should download. If you haven't downloaded it, do download it. You may already have done so in that uh, resources for this session. But DI is just telling us where that file is stored. Okay. So you, if you've, you just need to type in here the path where that file is stored. Okay. So easiest to go into Windows Explorer or the for the fault, the um, whether it's called in Linux, the, the file explorer or finder in uh, in Mac, copy and paste the uh, the path into into this string here, and then everything else should work. You only need to change this the f uh, this bit in relation to fi. Only need to change that if you change the name of the file that you down that you downloaded. Yeah, and you probably didn't, so I I don't think you'll have to change that. Um, and then the other thing to look out for when you're first running this, these are all outputs, by the way, generated by the code. I can, maybe I should remove those for now. So I'm going to ruin surprise. You'll see these outputs when you, when you run the code. The only other thing that you might want to change, or you will change later on, is here, 
but you see the box labeled three, query lack, query long. These are the coordinates of Novisad that I put in there. So we can pull out the calculated distance of all the weather stations in the archive from Novisad using that function that we defined earlier, and then uh, identify which of those stations is closest. So later on, I, uh, towards the bottom, where I say experiment playing around for finding data from different stations, you'll change these numbers here. Okay, so if you want to find the the um, weather station close to Karachi, Pakistan, for example, you look up latitude longitude of, of, the, of Karachi and you, you would put that latitude longitude in here. So you'd, you also may change these later. Um, otherwise, to begin with, you can just read all the commentary, run the code, reflect on any answer, any questions that are, are below. Um, and then when you get to the bottom, you'll see some independent work here. So the simple challenge is to, is to try downloading data for different sites. And you now have an idea of how to do that uh, by editing the code and running it again. And to, you know, to sort of uh, work on your, your climatological understanding at the same time as your programming understanding, it's just trying to find hot places. So think about where you'd expect the highest temperatures to be found, um, change the lat long, run the code, have a look at the output, and uh, including the output of this cell, was the bottom and uh, and see how you get on doing that the intermediate then this is where you have to start doing some independent programming and this if you haven't done python programming before this would be quite tricky uh, i imagine but hopefully you can maybe work talk to each other work together a bit of it if you do have some, some understanding i'll show you how to do it at the end anyway um, but if you if you want to try practicing it's copying and pasting code um, from above so all the codes there, you just have to put it in a loop to fulfill this uh, this challenge, the intermediate challenge. Um, and say if the loop is something completely new to you, then that will, you'll need to pair up with someone to uh, who does know what looping is and how to do that in Python to try and solve that. Um, and then the advanced one is very builds on the intermediate, but um, the challenge there is to the intermediate challenge. I didn't explicitly explain is to write code to download data from all weather stations not just one so how if we wanted to process all of them in the archive how would we totally go about doing that that's the challenge there and then advance is to repeat that from above but this time with the constraint that we only want to take stations that are within a certain distance of the query point that we've identified so for example if we're working with karachi um only we would say 100 kilometers only take um stations that are 100 kilometers from from karachi etc and again i'll show you i'll show you the answers to those uh, at the end so what i suggest we do then is you start working through that and ask me any questions as we go as we go along and then um come back in about oh, i guess 40 minutes or so to see how we're doing or at least see if you've if you've had a go at the challenges by then um and then see where you are. If you want some more time, then you can do. You can have a bit more time uh, before I show you the answers, or show you some answers, and, and talk to you about the other things that are worthy of our reflection earlier on in the notebook. But does that sound okay? I can see some faces. If you want to nod, if it sounds okay, if it sounds terrible, take your head. Okay, because it's nodding. That's all I needed. Okay, well, um, I'm, I'll, I'm here running through it my, myself. I'll just stop my sharing my screen. Um, but put, put any questions in the chat too is another another thing if you, if you don't, if you can't talk easily. Um, okay. Challenges at the end. Um, and there'll be opportunity to ask any questions, of course, too. So I now have the, the answer sheet or the, answer, the completed version open. And the first, first great trick is to show you that you can run all the cells at once by um, going to cells, oh. cell and run all. So rather than clicking in each one of them, you can run all the code that exists in a notebook by clicking run all. And then you see the star uh, there that tells you that it's waiting to, it's queued to run. Um, so the other ones are above are running. But as I scroll up, you can see these have stars in, so they're waiting. 
Um, oh, we've done that one. So that one's complete. Now the other is yours. So, uh, Tom, I'm sorry. Can, can yeah. you increase the size of your screen because we are uh, not not seeing it quite. So what what do you what do you see? So you say decrease the size of my screen. Increase increase, increase, increase the size. Do of you mean the, zoom in on the text? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Great. Okay, there we go. Yeah, thanks for thanks for letting me know. Um, okay, so I've just run everything. So now the, the workbook will be populated. So as we go through, the code will have already have run, and the output will be there waiting for us. So just talk through um, all the different bits we're doing. We discussed this one already. This was the, the, the pre preparation code cell where we're importing all of these modules that have useful functions for us to use later on. And we were defining a function. This is code that I'd, I'd written for us uh, with some explanation in here too. And I didn't point this out earlier, but when you put three speech marks like that, um, everything in between is also treated as as comments. So it's not read by Python, it's just there for us. The interpreter knows that that's not computer code. Everything else you see here is computer code and commented to, for us to be able to work out what it's doing later. Okay, so once we'd run that, um, the next the next bit of code, um, I said you should, you should change to update your local setup. So just put the folder there, the path, and hopefully that was uh, very painless. And then what the code does is it reads in the uh, the file that you have there, which is a CSV file. So you can actually open that in Excel or Notepad or something else outside to have a look at it to inspect it. So you, you can uh, get an idea of, of what it should look like when it's read into, into Python. And if you're not used to programming, um, that's a good general trip tip for you anyway. If you've got a file that is you can open elsewhere, um, doesn't require the programming to look at it, then it's a good idea to have a look at it elsewhere so you know what it should look like when read it correctly. Even people have been doing this for, for many years, it's still very easy to make mistakes. So have a look at what the data should look like um, and then have a way of checking once you, once you actually get the data into whatever programming environment you're working in. And the little, the little trick for um, previewing a data frame, and I should just back up and say a data frame is a particular data structure for uh, the pandas module pandas is one of those python modules that we view we're using that has loads of convenient python code to facilitate analysis of, of scientific data uh, very good for time series data in particular so we read it into read into a pandas data frame with this command the pd.read csv and i should also just back up and say when you see this type of syntax this language so pd dot pd is the pandas uh, module and just to really back up and make it completely transparent we know that because up here i said import blah 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 pandas as pd so pandas is now abbreviated pd so whenever we say pd python recognizes that we're referring to the pandas module that we that we imported and where we down here use this syntax pd dot read csv and um, again this is really Basics of Python programming will be on what we can really touch on that. It'll take many sessions in its own right. But just briefly to point out here, we access different tools from the from the module using this syntax. So full stop, and then either a function. In this case, it's a function called read CSV, which means bringing a CSV file into a data frame. Or sometimes we'll we'll put dot and then type in something that just returns a value, gives us an attribute. So we have attributes. Just tell us the maybe hold a bit of text or a number, etc. And we have methods or functions. And this is a method function to read in a CSV file to a data frame. And then the, that data frame in turn, which is now called stations, has a, has a function attached to it called head. And head just means preview, show me, print to screen, um, a set number of lines from the rows from the, from the data frame. In this case, Put number 10 in there so it will show us 10 rows from the data frame <laughs> this is just to check that everything's been read in okay uh, and so that's a really if you say use to not use program that's a critical thing to always do in your workflows have checkpoints where you can actually see what's going on because uh, it's really easy to uh, to make mistakes and, and and not spot them not know you know things can run just fine you get numbers out but you, you don't really want to trust them so this is what the data frame looks like and the way in which it was read in up here you see that call again so read csv read and this is the first argument is the file the, the file name 
and that's the variable fi that we assigned up here. So fi is a directory plus the, the CSV file name. And then the other thing I added was index col equals zero. And when we assign an index column, we say that whatever's in that column is, is not data, it's used to refer to rows in the, in the file, in, in data frame. And in this case, the, the index is the station ID in that file. Quite often, the reason why I'm pointing this out is quite often when you're importing data from a CSV file, we want the index to be time. And then we can do really powerful things like uh, calculating daily averages, monthly averages, et cetera, with a couple of lines of code. Python is fully aware of the, what time means in that instance, and the data are ordered in time. We make that connection, we specify the index column. In this case, the index column is just the ID of the stations. The other variables that we have in the column in the data frame are indicated by the column labels with the latitude in degrees north, the longitude in degrees east, and Z is meters above sea level for each station. So this is the metadata file from, uh, from for the HAD ISD data set. In case you're wondering where it came from, you can find it on the, the HAD ISD website. It's not actually on this page, it's on one of a few prior. Landing page I showed you in the, in the presentation. On that page, it tells you, gives you a link to download the metadata file. So to make this fully transparent, just download it from there to remove one step for us. Um, okay, so that's that's a preview of the data frame. Happy it's all been all been ready and okay. Um, and then, yeah, the next thing that I had you do is just to demonstrate again what, what Python can be used for very, in a very straightforward way. It can be used to visualize all of our results, including making maps. Very fancy. We can make animations. We can make any type of map uh, map projection. We can use any type of map projection display to display any type of geospatial data you can think of. This is the simplest one. Uh, just uh, scatter a scatter plot. Um, on a pair of axes with the projection set to actually a Robinson projection, it's not a plate Curie projection, as listed wrongly in the text description I gave. So Robinson projection, and then the points, locations of all those weather stations, that's latitude, longitude, put onto the map so we can see where they all are. So just bear this in mind, if you're doing uh, generic um, uh, science analysis, you want to visualize data on, on a map, I would suggest that moving away from, depending on what you're doing, how sophisticated, what, uh, uh, how flexible you need that mapping to be. So you can move away from tools like Arc and QGIS and do everything in Python if you wanted to. So all the figures I'll produce for publications, for example, will be done in, in Python. So a nice map shows us where the weather stations are. And let's also be um, climate scientists for a minute and note where they're actually located. So you know, great, we've got this resource, but where do we have data from? And where do we not have data from? Well, lots in North America, very, very uh, good coverage of, of stations in nor in um, northwestern Europe, um, including the Balkans, not too badly badly served. Uh, Japan, South Korea, and the populated uh, parts of Australasia are also also quite well served. But some huge data voids there. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa, large parts of northern Africa too. The Amazon Basin, Tibetan Plateau, and large parts of high latitude Eurasia and. North America and the, the, the really high latitudes of our planet, the Greenland ice sheet and the, um, the Antarctic ice sheets are not well monitored either, or at least not well represented in this archive. So often just be aware that we know very well what's going on or has gone on in temperate mid-latitude climates, not so much elsewhere. And in the context of extremes, just as worth pointing this out, most extreme humid heat on earth is found in the subtropics. So if you can see my mouse, that's this region here. And we don't have a huge number of observations from, from, those, from those locations. Okay, so, so moving on, I also showed you how to um, crudely but quickly summarize the, the length of uh, uh, the number of stations that are available to us. We have so over 9,000 that we can, um, we can choose from to explore, um, in this case, uh, temperature histories from the or temperature observations from the recent past. And then I suggested that for the reference point, which is the next thing in the, in the, in the code, the next thing we're gonna do is actually go to that metadata, got a method of calculating distances from a reference point to all the weather stations that are in that archive. So we're gonna use that to pull out or identify the closest weather station to a point that we specify. We're gonna use that distance function to find top of the notebook to do that. So um, the have assign function has been written for you. And this is the latitude longitude of, of Nevisad. Um, so you can change this one task later was to change it. The distance threshold said 100 kilometers. 
So now this code is going to uh, calculate the distances using that distance function by putting capitals to make sure we can recognize quite clearly when we call in that function. And we're just putting in the latitude and the longitude we specified up here, it's that function. And also all those reference latitudes and longitudes, that's the locations, those column vectors of the, um, the, the metadata file for the HAD ISD data set. And what's going to be returned is a list of distances, a vector of distances that is 9,278 uh, rows or minus one, because it won't include the, the, its, own, its own distance. Um, and then what we're doing is having, oh, sorry, no, it will be minus one we're talking about. It will have, it will be 9,278 uh, rows long. And then uh, we're doing in this, in this line, cell equals stations.lock. This is a way of referencing or drawing out rows of a, of a data frame that satisfy a certain criteria. Uh, the criteria are specified in the square brackets. You can only apply this type, exactly this type of syntax to a pandas data frame using this dot lock, um, this dot lock syntax. The same general idea, it's called logical indexing, applies across, well, pretty much every programming language you can think of that's set up for dealing with arrays of, of data. Um, so we're putting in a, a test here, a comparison, dists less than equal query dist. What that returns is a list of true or false. And that list is as long as the, um, as the stations data set is. So it's also got 9,278 rows, true everywhere, or well, so one, if you transform to a number, um, true slash one, everywhere where the distance is less than 100 kilometers, false slash zero, everywhere that is more than 100 kilometers. So what we're left with, we use this lock um, syntax, is only rows of stations, of the stations variable, stations data frame, that are less than or equal to 100 kilometers of distance from that query latitude and longitude. Um, so you'll see the output of this this tech, uh, this tech uh, code, because the rest of the stuff in here is just printing and, um, and yeah, just printing and drawing out the, the closest weather station. Again, using logical indexing here. So dists equals equals the minimum distance. And then we have to apply this particular syntax and pull out the, the ID of that uh, that station, and then printing it to screen. And the result is 13 stations and 100 kilometers of Novi Sad. Um, these are the IDs, and the closest is 15.3 kilometers from Novi Sad, and its ID is, is written here. We're going to use that ID in just a moment's time to build our, our URL for taking the data from the Met Office website. And for full transparency, so this is the code that does that, the heavy lifting in turn, and the magic bit really, the magic bit is going from uh, a link that we see on a website to getting the data behind that link and delivering it to us um, for analysis. And how do we do that? Well, the URL base, I found that by going to the, the Met Office page, trying, a data, trying one of the data sets, right clicking, copy the link address, pasting that into into the IPython notebook. So I could see what this, the full URL looked like and then spotted immediately that the end of the URL beyond the time period, it's indicated here, the last bit of the URL is uh, the isolation ID. That's how the, the data, the data set's organized. So the really powerful thing to pre-show this point is that we could, and we'll do this later, we can download data from any weather station once we know the ID. We just change that bit of the URL each time. The end of the URL well, that accesses the file includes the extension. So the file extension, which is a .nc extension, which is the file extension for a net CDF file that Carly may have talked to you about earlier, if not, I think of a session later on about net CDF files. They are the way of sharing, storing and sharing climbing data. The GZ bit made our life a bit more difficult uh, because it refers to a zipped, a zipped uh, file. So um, data stored in zip format to minimize uh, the amount of data that's been transmitted. Um, but it means we have to do a separate, this extra thing, we get that file to use it, we have to unzip it first. And that's what the rest of the code uh, was doing in here. So you can follow the specifics here, but we use the requests module to get the URL file and to write the contents to a, to a file on our own machine. And then using these other modules, the gzip, the shuttle, um, or shuttle, 
uh, module, how we unzip and copy that contents to a, now an unzipped NetCDF file. So that's what this bit was doing. This was the heavy lifting bit, really, the magic bit of getting the data. And this is transferable to any, any data set, not just metadata, but anything, any link that you can find on the internet. Oh. It's referencing a data set that's not behind a, a, some sort of security wall. Um, this will get you that, that data set. So use it wisely and responsibly. So let's give the data, unzipping it and still writing it to a local file. And then um, what we're doing down here is reading that data set in as a NetCDF file. We're using the NetCDF module, it's been written for Python to handle these NetCDF data sets. So something you'll use often if you, if you work with metadata, you, for example, if you're gonna read and write climate model data or reanalyses data that Carly spoke to you about earlier, you would use the NetCDF module in Python to open and indeed to write files of that in that structure. So the above was that general bit that was taking a file from the internet, uh, in this case also unzipping it and writing it to a local copy, that was the generic file management bit. This now is specific to metadata again, reading in the NetCDF file and doing, there's a, a few tricky little bits to get things in a convenient format for us, the first is transforming the time coordinate, the way in which time or the time variable that's stored in the NetCDF file to a format that Python understands for the pandas module that we're, going, we're using throughout in the rest of the analysis. So we use this code here that will look a bit um, look a bit cryptic, but it just, just gets it to time format into the right format for us. Um, and then this very important line that transforms the data in the NetCDF file that we read in, it puts it into a pandas data frame. So we're defining a data frame using this, this is a Python dictionary that we're defining. I say basically Python a bit beyond what we can hope to cover in a short session, but we're feeding the NetCDF uh, data set into a pandas data frame because pandas data frames are so useful for dealing with time data um, or time series data. Um, and then what we're doing here, this bit, I'm not sure how explicitly in the instructions, is we're limiting the data to, we well, get another logical index and, and, and test here. Um, something that fulfills two criteria, the year must be greater than 1990 and less than 2021. We're doing that actually just to be practical here. I, I checked, so I saw that 1990 to 1991 to 2020 had good data coverage. It's also the most recent 30 year climate normal period. So that's a common convention in climate analysis. We define the climate normal as a 30 year period. And so this 30 year period well represented in our data set. So we're cutting out just that bit for analysis. Previewing the data here again, you'll recognize this function with the, the dot head um, syntax, prints the first 10 rows of our data frame. So checking everything's been, been read in correctly. To our delight, we recognize times here, human readable times see the data in three hourly format. So I said, had ISD is, is sub daily. Um, some, some, some stations have data at hourly resolution, others three, some six. And I think there may even be less frequent resolution or, or a uh, great number of hours in, from other stations. We see temperature, dew point and air pressure, and they all look sensible is the first thing we observe. The units are degrees Celsius for temperature and dew point and hectopascal or millibar for pressure. There are ways of getting that information, by the way, it's a bit, we haven't got time to talk about it now, but you get it from the file, the metadata, you get the units from the file, from a NetCDF file. That's one of the things that's special about a NetCDF file, it's attached to the variable, will be a description of the units, um, which is very important for us when we're dealing with quantities that can be described using different, different units. For example, Fahrenheit, Kelvin, and Celsius, uh, pressure, hectopascal, uh, millibar, same thing essentially, but milligram, uh, milligrams of mercury, I think it is the other one, very rarely used, or, or east of mercury, whatever the, the, the unit is. So there are different ways of um, referring to these quantities, it's very important that we know the units that, we, that we're dealing with. Um, now, in this, this block, it shows some of the power of pandas. And if you've done programming stuff like Fortran or C, um, and had to grapple with non-time aware programming languages you'll appreciate how powerful this is or how simple this is then we can calculate the daily maximum in this hourly series with a with this bit of code so the data frame now is called recent we're calling a method which is resample so go from three hourly to some other period of time that's what the resample bit means 
And we're using just the abbreviation D to mean daily. And then the next question is, well, how should we resample it? We have um, eight values per, per day there. What do you want to do with them? How are we going to go from eight to one? And the final thing that we're asking is to use the max function to go from eight to one. So we're saying uh, compute the max for, for those eight values. So we do that now, D max is the daily maximum uh, time series, actually across all variables, temperature, dew point, and surface pressure, because we didn't specify a particular variable to subset by. And then we do something very similar for the uh, kind of the monthly climatology. We're now doing that to the maximum, this series. Uh, and we're using the group by function here, which says take all, all common entries of whatever I put in here and apply another function to all, uh, all common entries. And in this case, we're grouping by month. So everything that has a, a month one, calculate the mean, everything that has the month two, calculate the mean and so on. So that's the way we can generate the monthly climatology. And then we draw a plot. This is the basic syntax for creating plots in Python. So you can always refer back to this if you find something needed to plot. This is using the matplotlib library, which we imported as PLT. So it's quite unintuitive actually, you draw uh, an axis to plot on. So here we draw a figure and an axis to plot on. Um, and then we decide we draw on that pair of axes a particular type of plot here specified by the error bar. And then the entries in here give us our monthly climatology. It is plotted below here. And the error bars are plus minus one standard deviation that we also calculated up here using exactly the same syntax above, but this time calculating the standard deviation rather than the mean. So mean daily maximum is a function of month on the x-axis and the error bars are plus minus one standard deviation not a very pretty block but very quick to produce and uh, nice to visualize and we now know according to the statistically significant difference between what i imagine but um august is apparently the the, the, the month with the hottest uh the hottest hottest temperatures in Novisad, the highest t max so we're uh, well, close to, to, to Novi Sad, that's 15.3 kilometers from, from Novi Sad. So we've got a, a nice bit of climatological information out of that. Okay, so I'm aware that we've got too much time, so I'll speed up a bit as we go through this. The, um, the next bit of code is obviously just one example of the type of metric we can compute relative to extreme events from data like this. Frequency of tropical days and tropical nights. Um, tropical days, varying definitions of what they are here greater than the T-max greater than or equal to 30 degrees, tropical night T-max, or T-min uh, greater than or equal to 20 degrees. So there's some code in here that's specific to this particular question that we posed. Um, so here calculating in another logical test, so we turn ones and zeros, force it to be uh, a one, anywhere that's greater than 30, and then um, that's a time series now of ones and zeros. We can add up all the ones in a year, that will give us a number of tropical days and nights. Um, that's the trick we use here to, to do that. So we're not using a function called tropical days, tropical nights, we're just using our knowledge of how Python will, or pandas will return true, false, ones or zeros for rows of data, and then using, using that trick and the other tools in pandas to aggregate yearly in this case, to compute the annual frequency of tropical days and nights. And we end with a nice plot down here, where we have tropical nights uh, increasing, apparently, we'd be tempted to compute a trend, less obvious what's going on with tropical days. Um, but I want you to reflect here on what we might need to be wary of. We hadn't checked the data at this point. We just, other than seeing the first 10 rows, seeing it read it correctly, everything else was blind. And the next time we see an output, or we see the monthly climatology, and then we see the annual, the annual stuff here, and it could be tempting. Imagine you're doing this for every other station on Earth, and you want to know where we're seeing significant changes or greater changes in the frequency of tropical nights. You could put a trend line through this, through this uh, red line. Then you're summarizing this whole series with one number, the uh, change in tropical nights per year. Put that in, a, in another data set, do that for every weather station on Earth, 10, 10, almost 10,000 uh, numbers there to summarize change. But you may miss the fact that this trend could be influenced by things like missing data unless you've, unless you've checked. Look at 2005, apparently has no, no tropical nights, no tropical days. A very quick check, really quick and dirty way to plot this syntax tells us the reason why we have no tropical days and nights in 2005 is because there's no data from 2005. We only find that out when we, when we do a cursory check of the raw data like this. So there's no substitute for visualizing. Okay, I'll quickly then, in the last five minutes, just quickly show you 
the, the general way of getting data for every station on Earth, what a loop is. And if you don't, if you know this, this will be really easy and obvious. If you don't, it unlocks the magic of uh, programmatic analysis, reproducibility, et cetera, scalability. So I'm illustrating this with just 10 stations because otherwise we're going to download 10,000 files, take up a lot of space um, and take up a lot of time too. So I'm going to, the max station is just to cut this off at 10 stations. What we do, the, the trick is to define a variable with ID is going to take on lots of different values. And this is the syntax for it. It says for ID in stations.index, this is just some code here that says only use the first 10 rows of stations.index. Remember, stations.index is a, is a long list of all the IDs for the weather stations. And this syntax for x in something means let id, this is now a variable called id, let id take on the value of everything in whatever is written here. So if I said for id in, and then gave it a list of numbers, and the list was one, two, three, id would take on the value one the first time the loop executes, it take on two the second time the loop executes, and three the third time the loop executes. Because I'm saying id in stations.index, ID is going to take on the first ID of the stations index the first time the loop executes, second ID the second time it executes, etc. So then what I do is I paste in all of the instructions from earlier from different cells that I needed to download the file, to unzip the file, and to read it into Panda's data frame. I take those bits and I put them indented in the code. Indented in Python is a way of that Python is the way that Python knows what it should do within a, the within a loop. So the first time the loop executes, what should it do? It should do everything that is indented. And I would end this code by by typing something here. Like that. that will that will be executed once. Everything else above will be executed as many times as the loop as the loop runs. The loop here is going to run ten times. So the download is going to unzip and it's going to read in. Just copy the same code from above. The trick is I just put it inside a loop and I allowed ID and the ID is the thing that sets the URL that does the downloading. I just allow that to change every time. And then I could obviously put in more code in this loop that says calculate a trend, calculate something. Then we'll have that, that being done to every weather station that we, um, that we assess. So you can see the output of this did it 10 times, and all, all I was doing was reading it into a data frame each time. So it was just printing station, and then this syntax here allows us to input a string to a, a print statement. And I'm just inputting the ID here every time. So we can see the first time it read this station ID to data frame, and so on and so forth. The last, the last challenge was exactly the same, but just limited the, um, limited the list of stations to those that fulfilled this, this uh, query distance up here. So set the uh, number of stations, set the stations that only include those that were less than 150 kilometers away from the reference point in this case, and then had exactly the same code. Okay, so that's that's how you do those. Um, I can put this, I can put the answers also into the shared drive so you have this updated version as well. But that brings us to an end of this session. So if you have any questions, Feel free to fire them <coughs> across now, and I'll, I'll deal with them um, quickly. I've nothing to do in the next thirty minutes other than get another cup of tea before the senior re researchers uh, meeting. So, by all means, uh, leave any questions for me, and I'll, I'll answer them. I think there were a lot of questions, but <laughs> not <laughs> enough time. <laughs> okay. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Tom, for this. It's, You're it's, welcome. It was a really interesting uh, session. We had a great discussion here in the classroom. Oh, good. <clears throat> Thank you for this. Anybody wants uh, to ask a question? Martin. Uh, is it okay if um, I uh, ask our uh, early stage researchers to join us on uh, on the next session? Oh, of course, yeah, absolutely. If everybody yeah. who's interested can. Yeah, there'll, there'll be some. Round of, uh, there will be some <laughs> repetition from this one, by the way, but there's also some independent stuff. Um, it, it works quite well if you've done this already, because then you can focus on the new bits. Okay, so whoever is interested can really join us at four o'clock. I will just uh, send a, a, a link okay, for, 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 a for a Zoom. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. 
Okay, so I'll see you in that other in the other um yes the, for the other link, and I'll see you in half an hour or just under half an hour. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, there there was one question. Oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, from, please. From Julia, uh, how different is the code if you want to plot net CDF on a map? You can see oh. you can see the the question in the chat. Oh yeah, sorry. Let me just get the chat up. Uh, where is it gone? Ah oh, yes, okay. Uh, yeah, how different is it if you plot the, the CDF on a map? Not uh, very, depends on what you want to plot, because at the moment we have um, we have lots of variables for every from, from every weather station that we can we can that we access. We've got temperature, we just read three in, but we have um, thousands of rows of temperature, thousands of rows of sea level pressure, and thousands of rows of dew point temperature for every uh, for every point, every weather station. So if we're doing a scatter plot, how do we reduce that to one value per weather station? It's very straightforward to um, compute, for example, the, um, the maximum 95th percentile and, and then color a point on, on the map. Doing that, we can do that straight from the NetCDF data, um, or we can do it whilst it's been passed into a pandas data frame. Um, the code for manipulating NetCDF data is quite straightforward. Um, because what happens is the way in which it's dealt with in pandas, or sorry, in Python, is that once we use that line, I'll just show you in here, so you can still see my screen. I think that's the only question, so I can minimize that. Um, I'll just show you where we read the main CDF data in. Uh, yeah, so that's the looped version. Maybe there. Excellent. Next block. Yeah, here. So where we where we read it in at this point, data is um, it's a it's a, a data. It's a um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's an object that we can access all of the variables in that CDF uh, data set with. We can also access all the metadata through. Um, when we read it into Python for analysis, let's say we just want to read in the air temperature data for analysis. The default way it's read in is um, as a, 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 a NumPy array. So NumPy is the module that's used for numerical analysis in Python. So um, you can think of very similar, if you worked in MATLAB before, it's very similar to the MATLAB uh, matrix. There, there are slightly different matrices and arrays in NumPy, but basically we can read in the raw data from NetCDF very straightforwardly into, a, into a, uh, a NumPy array, and then we have the raw numbers to deal with. And then we can do we can flexibly plot those any way we like, um, depending on which module we're using. So we use the CartaPy module to plot. Um, we could use the CartaPy module again to plot those raw NumPy arrays. And the reason why this is quite a long answer is it really depends on the type of data as to how we plot on a map. If we've got continuous gridded data like reanalyses data, then we might want to produce a contour plot. We might want to produce a color. Um, color ramp plot where the intensity of the color tells us the temperature for example for like the the, the, the map i showed you in the lecture this small uh, earlier on where we saw temperature across the surface of the earth we can easily produce those using the carter pi module and base map python module but it really depends on the quantity we're plotting whether it's discrete or continuous um, and so on but the that bit of the code is um you know no more complex than what we've done it's just a different quantity to to plot So any other questions? I'll just get the chat open again. Uh, yeah, so PCA, there are, there are modules to perform uh, PCA in, um, in Python. Um, you, look, the, way to, the way to find out is to quickly search. Uh, P, principal Components Analysis Python in the stats, mo stats models, stats, I remember the name of the, of the module, but there's a stats um, module that's available in Python. The SciPy, which is scientific Python, may also have modules, principal components analysis, and um, essentially anything you can think of, any type of numerical analysis you can think of, machine from machine learning to uh, more traditional statistics to um, any type of, I mean, even fully fledged climate models can be written in Python. So anything you can think of numerically to do, you can do if you know the raw ingredients, and quite possibly, um, a lot of it already exists out there in a the module. So yeah, you could do. You can use you can do PCA in, in this too. 
thank you, Tom. I think it's uh, time to.